everybody. My name is uh, Jose Miguel Cruz. I'm the Director of Research at the Latin American and Caribbean Center. Uh, welcome to the 30th Interdisciplinary Faculty Colloquium. Uh, this is our first colloquium for, uh, for this academic year. Thank you all for joining. Uh, it's an honor to introduce this colloquium, not only because this, as I said, is the first of the, of the academic year, right? Uh, but also because it's uh, our opportunity to introduce our new members of the LAC family. And we start precisely around a topic in which LAC is putting a lot of effort and this is the initiative around Brazil, Brazilian studies. So it is my honor to welcome uh, new members of the, of the FIU family, of the LAC family, and we'll be talking about protecting the social environment heritage of Brazil. So for today, we have uh, two distinguished scholars, three distinguished scholar, scholars. Uh, first, we will hear from Professor Clinton Jenkins. Uh, I'll talk to you about, about his, his resume uh, uh, briefly. He is an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Environment. And, and he's part of the initiative for Brazilian studies at the Kimberly Green Latin American Caribbean Center. His program focuses on the conservation of biological diversity and efforts to reduce the loss of tropical species and ecosystems. He specializes in combining spatial, mo spatial, mo spatial modeling of biodiversity with analysis of conservation policy. The aim is to direct conservation efforts toward places to save biodiversity most efficiently. Dr. Jenkins has substantial experience in applied conservation as, as he previously spent seven, year, seven years at a Brazilian conservation nonprofit. He also runs the Biodiversity Mapping o, a ORG site for the dissemination of data on global biodiversity. He will be he will be talking about protecting the natural and cultural heritage of Brazil. Then we'll hear from Professor Simone Achaidi. Uh, she is an associate professor with a young appointment in the Department of Global and Social Cultural Studies at the Kimberly and the Kimberly Green Latin American Caribbean Center. Dr. Achaide is an environment anthropologist and interdisciplinary ecologist who has worked across the Amazonian region for over 20 years, a lot of experience, supporting indigenous peoples and local communities, self-determination and sustainable life livelihoods, as well as biocultural and territorial rights. Uh, her uh, presentation is entitled, Protecting Biocultural Diversity in the Brazilian Amazon, the role of indigenous peoples and local communities. Then, uh, after their presentations, we'll, we will hear comments from Professor Coya, Eligia Collado Vides. She is a teaching professor and associate chair at the Department of, of Biological Sciences. She is a mar marine botanist with a research emphasis in ecology of tropical marine macroalgae, commonly known as seaweeds. Her research focuses on evaluating the effects of land based uh, stressors on coastal ecosystems and their potential impact in coral reef and seagrass ecosystems. She's also interested in the effects of climate change on coastal ecosystems, and her laboratory is conducting research on the role of calcareous green algae in the carbon budget of Florida Bay and the Mexican Caribbean. Each participant will have 15, between 15 and 18 minutes to present their research, and then we'll hear from Professor Collado Vides, uh, provide her comments on the presentation. Then we will open uh, questions uh, for the audience. So please uh, uh, um, take notes on your questions and then you can uh, make the questions using, using the chat. Uh, let me just tell you before we begin that this meeting is recorded and we, uh, we want to keep this and to uh, um, preserve this for further dissemination as part of the LAC program. Without further ado, I will leave you com with uh, Professor Jenkins. Thank you all for coming. All right, thank you, Rosa Miguel. Um, let me see. Let's share screen.
Okay, share screen is working. All right, um, so again, thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I see some familiar faces in the, in the Zoom boxes. Um, and uh, just to say, I'm, I'm glad to be a part of this new initiative and, and at FIU. Um, currently, I'm, I'm still in Brazil, um, but hopefully I will move uh, to be there in, in person at FIU soon and um, to really push this uh, initiative forward and work more closely with my, my colleagues um, there in Miami, as well as, as here in Brazil. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, briefly about the how we, we go about protecting natural and cultural heritage of Brazil. I think Simone will, will talk more about the, the cultural heritage aspect and the, the social aspects. Um, but just briefly, an uh, introduction of some context of, of who I am and how I got here and what sort of work I, I do. Um, I've been working in Brazil for uh, nearly 20 years, um, basically since uh, my PhD, half of which is done in Brazil. Um, and I've been living here for the, the last seven years. I'm currently in the, the southern part of Brazil. Um, this here's a photo of my backyard a few years ago. It's a very nice place in the, near the, the Atlantic Forest and um, interior part of Sao Paulo State. Um, and I hope you'll see in the, in the work that I, I talk about, the research that I do is um, cross-disciplinary, right? It's, it's an attempt to solve problems. So even though I'm trained in ecology, I try to include various aspects of other disciplines to understand the environmental problems the world faces, specifically in Brazil, and, and what we might do to, to improve the situation. Um, and specifically, I focus on uh, what I term actionable conservation science. And so what do I mean about um, actionable science? Right? It's applicable in making, in dis making decisions, right? So there's some parts of science um, that are, are, are true, pure basic applied science, trying to understand the world better. Um, they're not necessarily about solving a specific problem. It's more about gaining knowledge and, and understanding the world, perfectly valid, you know, great advances in, in the world have been made in that direction. I've chosen to focus um, what I do on things that are more immediate than need and for some of the decisions um, that need to be made in, in the coming years or, or decades, and specifically in solving specific problems. And so some examples of that, um, what parts of the world or what parts of a, of a country um, need to be protected in, in, the, in terms of the, the natural world, right? Where do we, where are the gaps in the protected area system? Or how do you quantify threats to, to nature, right? Where, what are the vectors of, of our environmental um, impact in the world? And specifically, I want to do science that is policy relevant. And that's sort of a moving target, right? Um, policies are generally um, national or, or state in nature. They, they vary by, by region. And so what the type of science or, or research that might be necessary in, in one context may not be very applicable in another, depending on what the, the regulations or, or laws are in that country and how they are applied. And so for Brazil, I'll talk a little bit about some of the major environmental policies and how um, the research um, that we do is important to take that context into consideration so that it can be more relevant. Um, a little bit um, about, there we go. About Brazil and its biodiversity, um, it is arguably um, the most biodiverse country, or second. Um, there's some debate; depends on how you how you measure that. Um, Colombia would be the the most likely rival if you're talking about terrestrial biodiversity, um, but it's it's certainly up there the the top or the the second most most diverse country in the world. Um, it's an interesting situation because Brazil has both very intact ecosystems um, in a global context, such as, I mean, the Amazon is, is extremely large. It still has most of its forest, certainly suffering some, some great impacts recently, but com compared to many parts of the world, it's, it's still um, largely, it's, it's still there. On the other hand, you have 
huge ecosystems that have been severely damaged. Um, a lot of the work um, that goes into them is about restoring those ecosystems. What, what do we need to do to bring them back or, or, or save what's, what's left? And then you have another context of, of all of the unknown. Because a country like Brazil has so much biodiversity, it's very difficult to document and understand all of it. And the tendency is that fewer resources and fewer researchers have been um, focused on that, that task. Uh, very different than if you're in a, you know, a, a smaller country, in a northern country, where there may only be 1% as many species and 10 or 20 times as many scientists uh, studying those species, whereas in Brazil, there are parts of the country um, there's no scientifically documented information about most of what's there. Um, a little bit of, of <clears throat> uh, I think, an aspect important for understanding um, how we go about protecting um, Brazil's natural environment and how the, the, some of the environmental laws are organized. We need to understand that what are known as biomes, right? biomas in, in Brazil. And this, the definition of this varies a little bit compared to um, what it might be in um, some of your ecological textbooks. Right? Biomes have a legal definition in, in the Brazil context, and there's six of them. Um, <clears throat> so the Amazon, um, widely known. There's also the Atlantic forest here in bright green. I trust you can see my, my pointer here. Um, those are probably the two more uh, well-known big forest ecosystems. There's also the, the Kachinga in the Northeast. It's largely unknown uh, outside of Brazil. Uh, it's a very dry, deserty type ecosystem. There's the huge Cerrado, which is a huge uh, savanna in the interior of the country. Um, one of the old, perhaps the oldest savanna in the world. The Pantanal, which is uh, one of the world's largest wetlands, and then the Pampas um, down in the south, which is a, a grassland. At the moment, I live, I'm in the frontier between the Mata Atlantica and the Pampa here. Um, <clears throat> and so again, these biomes have legal consequences, such as how you can use your land. Right? If you're a property owner, you have a, a, a farm and you know, maybe it's partly forested, how much of that land you can actually use differs depending if you're in the Atlantic forest or if you're in the Amazon. Right? Atlantic forest is generally about 20% needs to be reserved and protected and Amazon can be 50 or 80% or legally is supposed to be set aside for, for nature. Um, and the, the, the rules differ for the other biomes as well. And you can imagine this can create um, some arguments, right? You know, is that just or not? Um, that the rules vary depending on where you are. Um, and there's immense debates and conflicts occur in the country based on who's deciding what the limit is, right? Are you in the Atlantic forest or in the Cejado? And I've seen some of these firsthand that sometimes it's, it's, it's a very vague sort of line, right? Because transition from a forest to a savanna is generally sort of a, a gradient and somebody draws the line it's like no this is the Atlantic forest this is the Cerrado and depending on where that line is drawn can greatly affect what people can do um, in terms of, of activities and sometimes it does appear to be quite arbitrary um, and this creates confusion as well sometimes because for instance the ecological definition of what would be something like the Amazon is different than the hydrological definition of the Amazon basin. And it's different from what is known as the legal Amazon, which is a political uh, delimitation that has some areas that are clearly cejado in, in their biological nature. Um, and the history of these areas is quite different uh, as well. This is a map I made several years ago um, for a paper my colleague was working on in uh, forest fragmentation. Um, the impacts of it. If you look on the left, these areas in green are an, an estimate of what the original forest cover was for the, the Amazon in Brazil and for the Atlantic forest, right? reconstructed uh, estimate. The areas in yellow and red are sort of edgy forest, so possibly degraded or slightly um, affected by other, other factors. 
if you look at what that forest cover is today, the, the difference is, is dramatic. Right? The Atlantic forest is mostly gone, right? Just 90% uh, deforested, turned into pasture, agriculture, cities. And there's 10%, could be 8%, 12%. The numbers vary depending on who's counting, but most of it's been converted and a lot of what's left is little edgy fragments, these orange areas, and so that are somewhat degraded. If you compare that to the Amazon, even though there's been a lot of impact in the Amazon, certainly on the, the, the southern and eastern sides, there's a huge amount of the Amazon which is um, in, intact as a forest. Right? Uh, a fair amount of it has had some effects from, from overhunting and some infiltration, um, but as an ecosystem, it's far better off than something like the Atlantic forest. Right? And this is important because people often confuse what the situation is in terms of the forest, right? The conditions are, are dramatically different ecologically. Um, it's these two ecosystems that I focus most of my attention over the years in terms of research. Um, but increasingly moving forward, I would like to, to look at some of the other biomes as well. <clears throat> now, if you hear anything about Brazil, certainly in the, in the US, it's usually negative, right? Brazil seems to be constantly in crisis. To a certain extent, that may be true. There seems to be a never-ending series of environmental and political crises. But you know, recently, if you look at the headlines that come out, you know, the Amazon's on fire. It's you know the end of the world. Uh, there's illegal mining going on. It's it's a constant barrage of uh, of sad news, right? And you know, there there are some certainly some big challenges. Um, it's not new this year. Um, you know, things have not changed um, dramatically from one year to the next in terms of the drivers of, of environmental problems in the country. And there tend to be waves of when the world is paying attention or not to, to what's going on. Um, but you gotta remember it's, you know, bad news gets, gets attention easily. What doesn't get attention is that there actually are some very positive things um, that are going on in Brazil. There's, um, there's a lot of innovation in the conservation world. Um, there are successes. Um, this particular monkey here, um, which works the, the people that work in the conservation of that for my entire career. It's the golden lion tamarind, right? There's some golden lion tamarinds there in Miami. I think a couple at the Miami Zoo or, or Zoo Miami. That's considered one of the greatest conservation successes for a primate in the entire world. Right? It's almost extinct. It was brought back from the edge. Uh, there's a pretty good population of it. It's in the state of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, the group that works with it has done you know, fabulous work, both you know, with the community and bringing forth uh, this as a, as a symbol of conservation. And some really innovative stuff for the country. I mean, this is um, now completed the first what will be the first forested bridge across a highway in Brazil, right? Um, you could, the, the trees have been planted. You can't see it in this image. The trees are only, they're like this tall. They're, they're, they're freshly planted. And it was, a, it was a battle for this, but it was critically important because this bridge that goes across over a four lane highway will connect one of the most important biological reserves in the country or in the Atlantic forest that would have been isolated by this highway and had populations of, of rare endangered species. And they will now be able to cross over into um, other areas of forest on the, on the left side of this figure and up into the mountains and connecting over to another, eventually another biological reserve, which is the other end of the distribution of this species. And, you know, there are very few countries in the world that have done something like this, right? To build a large physical structure to increase connectivity and landscape in the face of something like a four lane highway, right? Brazil has done it under lots of opposition. Um, it'll be monitored, part of that, that, that monitoring, trying to understand, is it effective? Um, and is it a good investment um, in terms of, of conservation, right? That gets a little bit of news. I don't know if it even made it into any of the US media, but you know, it's a huge conservation accomplishment. And there are others like this, but you know, just remember that 
good news does happen, you know, monkeys, you know, and they can, they can adapt. They will go across this bridge once the trees grow. Um, <clears throat> we do, we do have successes. Um, so what I want to focus um, on in my time at, at FIU, uh, continuing work I've, I've been doing for years, um, hopefully expanding that while I'm at FIU, is what are solutions to, to some of the challenges, right? And a lot of this I think is, it needs to be done is in terms of policy evaluation. Do the, the environmental policies of Brazil work? Um, what aspects of them don't work? Uh, how, how could they be improved? This comes back to that idea of doing science that's relevant to, to policy decision making. And so briefly, a few I'd like to look at are like the forest code, which is a major law in the country, um, priority areas for biodiversity, and uh, in the Amazon, how, what do we do in relation to the Amazon and its, its future? And some of these involve um, some advanced technology. I'm not going to go into detail, but just bioacoustic monitoring and modeling of ecosystem services. I'm not, I don't have time to go into detail, but that's part of the program as well. So if you look at the forest code, that's one of the major legislations um, that control governs uh, land use. It has components that say, you know, this, this idea that, hey, your 20% of your land has to be uh, reserved as forest and you have to protect riparian buffers um, on your land. And this varies depending on who the landowner is and what state they're in, what, which of those biomes you're in. Um, does it work? Well, there's a lot of evidence it doesn't because a lot of areas don't have forest. Um, but recently there's been, it was revised for better or worse. It was, the rules were changed. There's now for the first time uh, an environmental registry uh, for land known as, as CAR where people have to say, here's my land. Have I protected a certain amount of forest? What more do I need to uh, protect? And that information is supposed to be public. So you can see it's like, hey, that landowner is not complying with the law or is it? And so this opens up the opportunity to, to evaluate the effect of, effectiveness of the law and increase um, enforcement. And of course, there is a lot of challenges in Brazil in terms of enforcement and, and corruption, right? Even in the environmental community, um, it is not uncommon for um, environmental police as they're known to, to occasionally solicit a bribe when they find somebody not in compliance with the forest code or fabricate um, evidence to say hey you know your 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 cattle are ending in the river so pay this fine and you know it didn't happen but somebody has to pay pay off the the people who are supposed to protect and enforce the environmental laws have to be bribed even by the people who are complying with the law so that's that's a challenge. Um, the priority areas for biodiversity, this is an effort done nationwide for, for all of the biomes. So the, the federal government has a specific uh, program or policy where they identify all of the pieces of the country that are the highest priority for biodiversity protection. It's not that the protected areas, it's that these areas are places to look at to complement what's already protected to make a more complete uh, system. Um, not necessarily even to become protected areas, but we're to focus uh, attention. So I led the, the process for this for the Atlantic Forest. This was one of the final results map that identifies all of the, the areas that are priorities and importantly, what, what should be done in those areas, right? Is it protected area? Is it better enforcement? Is it resolving uh, land use conflicts? Um, so I want to continue to focus upon that. Um, there is a clear methodology for how this process is done. I think there are ways to improve it and work with the Ministry of the Environment to, to talk, to discuss that and how we can uh, improve that process going forward. Um, and then lastly, as I mentioned, um, a part of my program is focused on the Amazon. Um, the Amazon is, is obviously a huge area. It's, you can't simplify it in, in one slide, but just to, to cover the basics is remember that, you know, even though people tend to associate Brazil with the Amazon and vice versa, it's, it's really in, in a whole series of countries. And what happens in one country 
Um, the Amazon in one country tends to affect other countries, especially Brazil, because Brazil is actually downstream um, in the Amazon from all the others. And there are a lot of factors coming in. There's a lot of sectors that affect the Amazon. There's roads, where do you put roads? There's a lot of resources there, oil and gas, minerals. There's a lot of hydroelectric dams being built. A whole series of issues that myself and other people, including Simone, leads the, the Amazon Dams Network, has been looking at these sorts of issues and, and, and what to do about them and going forward. And a very important aspect of that is, is how to pay for good management of the Amazon, right? Who, who and how to, to pay for keeping it intact and who, who decides that, right? Because there are millions of people living in the Amazon and they, they want to make a living somehow. How do they do that while keeping the Amazon as a, as a large function, functioning ecosystem? And who ultimately will be responsible uh, for that? And a lot of those are, are social decisions. They're not, they're not ecological or biological decisions. Um, and lastly, just to wrap this up, um, part of this, this Brazil initiative that we're, we're, we're working on is, is to increase um, the presence of FIU in terms of Brazil, right? You know, there are hundreds of, of Brazilian students at FIU. There are thousands or you know, hundreds of thousands of Brazilians now in, in South Florida. Um, and one of the, the things I like to, to focus on with Simonia and others there is, is kind of organizing and increasing the presence of Brazil in terms of the, the intellectual community um, and the, the influence of, of FIU in, um, in, in, in better informing the public about Brazil, the realities of Brazil and the exchange of, of, of capacities between the, the two countries. Um, the first challenge is that I need to actually get from Brazil to Miami and FIU in the middle of a pandemic, but we, we will overcome that challenge. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up and uh, pass to my, to my colleague. Thank, thank you, Clinton. Um, Professor Achaidi? I think I have to stop sharing here. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Let me share my screen here, just one second. Can you see the screen, the presentation? Great. Okay, let's get started here. Thank you so much, Clinton, for your great presentation. And uh, some points that Clinton mentioned, I think are super relevant and connected to some of the topics I will be approaching in my presentation as well. So I think our, our work is very, um, there is a lot of intersections and, and potential for collaborations across our fields. So I'm going to be talking specifically about protecting the biocultural diversity in the Brazilian Amazon, uh, the role of indigenous peoples and local communities. Just one second. Yeah. So I'm going to get started uh, talking about the pre-Columbian legacy of indigenous peoples in the distant past and how indigenous peoples have helped to shape some of the forests uh, patches that, we, that exist in the Amazon today. I'm gonna be defining biocultural diversity and biocultural landscapes in the Amazon, talking about the importance of coordination also with protected areas, forming corridors, of protected corridors. I'm gonna highlight some products of the social biodiversity or the bi biocultural diversity of the Amazon and the potential for uh, strengthening the bioeconomy of the region as one of the solutions for the region. And then the potential also for interconnecting indigenous uh, and local knowledge and science in uh, conservation of biodiversity and management of indigenous uh, lands and protected areas. And finally, I'm just gonna share uh, a project that I have been involved which is the Local Indicators of Climate Change project that involves also indigenous peoples all over the world. And I'll, I'll end with that. So I copy in Clinton because he just said who he is. I, I included this slide also to, uh, to just uh, explain a little bit who I am and uh, what uh, are my research interests and expertise that I, I'm bringing to FIU. So I am an interdisciplinary scientist, you know, you know, interdisciplinary scientists, sometimes they are like, they have an identity crisis. They really, uh, they try to find themselves into um, uh, these uh, many disciplinary fields. 
is starting to cross these disciplinary boundaries, which are very fuzzy. Uh, so I consider myself an interdisciplinary scientist because I started as a, as a biologist and then I did um, ecological interdisciplinary ecology with a concentration in anthropology. But I also, I lived for 10 years in the Xingu indigenous territory, Xingu indigenous land in, in Brazil. And I worked as a researcher as, um, for a national NGO, the Instituto Socioambiental for these 10 years. I like to collaborate and articulate the collaborations across academic fields within academia, but also co-production of knowledge between academia and society and a little bit of what, so what Clinton does, which is like policy relevant research or applied research, participatory research. And then finally, Black Piranhas being, be aware because while I was uh, living in the Xingu for 10 years and one of my fishing excursions, I, I, I fish probably 10 black piranhas and indigenous peoples in the boat were really like uh, what how she is getting all these piranhas and we are not getting anything right uh, so I'm just saying black piranhas be aware but since then no more fishing I'm looking forward to go fishing in Miami I'm actually in Miami so I was, I was already living in Gainesville before I came here working at University of Florida so it was just a five hour drive to come to Miami where I'm living right now so the Amazon. So my, my presentation also be focused, uh, will be focused on the Amazon, specifically where I have been working. And Clinton and I, I just want to mention this initiative that Clinton and I are part of, and I see Thomas Lovejoy also is part of, and, and some other colleagues here at FIU and different institutions uh, all over uh, the Amazon countries, is the science panel for the Amazon. It's an initiative of the Sustainable Development Solutions of the United Nations, which um, has this group of scientists working together in suing a comprehensive report, a unique probably uh, report on the state of the Amazon, as well as recommendations to its sustainable development, uh, integrating science policy and culture. Um, we just yesterday, so you might access here uh, by clicking on this uh, link later, hopefully the presentations will be shared with everyone. Uh, we issued this letter that was shared in the United Nations Summit on Biodiversity yesterday with a pledge to save the Amazon that we put together just yesterday. Uh, so uh, we have a huge pre-Columbian legacy that we experience in our everyday lives. We don't, don't maybe reflect a lot about that, but uh, a lot of the products, a lot of the food we eat uh, and the connections we have uh, derive some of the important, very important domestication processes uh, from pre-Columbian indigenous peoples that did this domestication for many, many, many years. And the Amazon is a very important center of agrobiodiversity. And I just put some examples here of peanuts. Actually, the Xingu indigenous land is a very important center of peanut diversity. They, they cultivated 40 different varieties of peanuts. It was incredible to experience all these peanut varieties in the village and the food that is cooked with them. Uh, sweet potato, manioc, of course, is a, is a classical crop, a very important crop all over the Amazon, charros, uh, corn, and others. Uh, when, the European, uh, when the Europeans arrived in the Amazon, there were a lot, a lot actually of indigenous peoples with very sophisticated systems of uh, aquaculture and aqua, um, aquascapes management uh, and forest management as well. There was a lot of food being produced um, this population, around 90% of this population actually perished in the first centuries of the European colonization, but the practices developed by pre-Columbian indigenous peoples have altered patches of uh, diversity and uh, forest diversity and structure in the Amazon. And this has been a lot of evidence um, showing that these anthropogenic landscapes that were formed by indigenous management and manipulation of uh, biodiversity. And here is some, just a summary in this figure of some of the practices that are still 
uh, practiced by indigenous peoples and some of the local communities uh, and they will contribute to forest structure and functioning such as removal of no useful plants, protection, transportation, and planting of use for plants and still like semi-domestication and domestication processes still happening. Attraction uh, of non-human animal dispersers in these areas that concentrate a lot of resources. Selection of phenotypes, fire, fire management, very important, and soil improvement, uh, just to summarize some of them. And then so what we, when we talk about biocultural diversity, what is it biocultural diversity? Do you experience biocultural diversity? in a daily life, in your daily lives? Can you give me an example, maybe in the chat, of some biocultural diversity interaction uh, you have uh, in your daily lives and you enjoy? So basically it's everywhere, right? Uh, recognizing these connections and very strong interconnections and co-evolution really of humans and nature, uh, of humans and biodiversity over time. And I gave some examples of these anthropogenic landscapes. Uh, and uh, they are also connected with language and how you designate, how you classify the environment. And the words you use are connected to cultural practices, to rituals and other aspects that are very important to keep these systems alive. So these are like co-evolving systems of language, biodiversity and cultural diversity. That's, that's what it is. So for example, for the Kayabi, a people that I worked for over 20 years, in the Shingu uh, land, they have this designation of Kofet, which is a forest that grows on anthropogenic soils. These anthropogenic soils are formed over long time, many, many, many years of manipulation uh, and the archeological remainings of indigenous populations form this rich soil, it's called terra preta or black uh, earth soils. And in these specific anthropogenic soils grow forests that have a very particular composition of species. A lot of palm species, um, maybe some uh, Brazil nut stands and things like that that you, you can recognize that these forests are, grow, are growing on these terra preta or anthropogenic soils. And for the Kaya B, they name, they designate this forest as Kofet. So Ko is like agricultural crop uh, plot, agricultural plot, and fat, something that was in the past. So they call the for this type of forest co-fat, something that was agricultural plot in the, in the past. So you can see the connections between cultural diversity, bio, uh, biological diversity, and uh, linguistic diversity as well, which is the main idea of biocultural diversity that I want to convey. So this is just to show a map that also we have a huge cultural diversity uh, connected to the biodiversity in the Amazon and the, the cultural diversity, one of the um, proxies or indicators of cross cultural diversity used are languages, diversity of languages that sometimes you can map out. Uh, if you do a map of the world's diversity, you can map out and see that areas with huge biodiversity are also areas with great cultural diversity and many languages that are spoken. And in the Amazon, we have around 300 indigenous languages spoken and many of them are threatened with disappearing. Also, uh, who are the local communities, right? What is this concept, where they are and how can we define local communities? So in the SPA, we are also proposing a definition of local uh, communities, local or traditional communities. We use the designation proposed by United Nations that is more general. Traditional communities are more used in Brazil when they actually have recognition in policy. There are policies that recognize them as traditional communities. Uh, basically, we are very inclusive in the definition that we are proposing to recognize that there is a great diversity of these local communities that many times hold uh, resources collectively or hold lands collectively. Uh, they have a very, very uh, tied, the livelihoods are very tied to place and to natural resources. 
and also they are the knowledge that they have has been developed over many years of coexistence with these natural resources. So rubber cappers, the riverine communities, fishers communities, the babasu coconut breakers, that are mainly women that do the babasu uh, coconut uh, breaking and commercialization here. Uh, and also the Afro uh, many Afro-descendant communities that we have in the Brazilian Amazon called quilombolas that are remaining from uh, slaves uh, in the past and then became these communities that now have rights to their territories, uh, um, ancestral territories and designated uh, lands now by the Brazilian government. So in this map, you can see that indigenous lands and protected areas, they form uh, biocultural corridors, and you can see in the light gray are uh, protected areas of the Amazon. In this kind of dark gray are indigenous lands. You can see here the Shingu Park where I lived for many years. I miss it. Uh, there is a lot of deforestation going on around these areas, and some inside these areas also deforestation. So this shows the areas with uh, more deforestation inside indigenous lands by, you know, invasors. Just yesterday, I was watching a presentation from an um, indigenous leader that is from the Urue uh tribe, and it was talking about how they are fighting uh, and monitoring against many invasions and kind of uh, logging inside their land, inside their territory here in Hondonia state. Um, and you can see so how much is protected in the Amazon, also not only Brazil, but outside Brazil, as Clinton said, is a big area with many different countries, eight countries and a territory uh, that share the Amazon biome. So what happens there also affects us and what happens in the Amazon affects everyone, pretty much everyone in the world uh, in one way or the other, sooner or later. Uh, here, the Quilombolas, the, the Afro-descendant uh, lands, are, sorry, the map is not a very good definition here, but they have been uh, struggling for land titling and recognition of their rights uh, for a long time. The Brazilian government has a special, uh, special institute that takes care of the upper descendant communities, the Quilombola communities, but many, many of their lands are still in process of recognition. So you can see 165 recognized and 1,525 still to be recognized by the Brazilian government. Some of them are in the Amazonian region, but all over Brazil as well. And they, these communities uh, have this very close interaction and livelihoods that are closely tied to the, to the natural resources and the non-timber forest uh, uh, resources as well, products. One of them is Brazil nut. So also uh, was a recent uh, research that was showing how Brazil nut stands also have been manipulated and protected by indigenous peoples in the past. And today we have a rich economy that is based on Brazil nuts and is based upon this legacy. Other products from the bioeconomy of the Amazon, they're very important uh, globally. Who doesn't like an acai, right? In Miami, you can go and have acai maybe on campus. Once the, the pandemic is over, we can get an acai together, right? But, so in the, it also acai management, it's, it's a type of agroforestry system can be, uh, can be combined with also agriculture and forestry together. Um, and these agroforestry systems are now being implemented in different parts of the country, but the origin of the agroforestry cultivation, agroforestry systems comes from indigenous uh, people's manipulation of forests and, and the crop fields together. Um, so it's another important product of the social biodiversity in Brazil. And this I borrowed from the letter that was submit submitted yesterday to the United Nations event, just to show the importance of uh, the Amazonian products for the uh, local and regional economy and world economy. So some of the main products are cocoa and cho uh, chocolate, chocolate, right? Teobroma cacao, uh, rubber, very, still a very important product. Uh, we know what happened in the past with the Asia uh, rubber plantations, but still a very significant product uh, in, in the Amazon. Uh, sweet potato and a say berry, and they generate a lot of money uh, locally and regionally. So important products uh, of the bioeconomy, of the economy of the forest. So you don't have to cut down the forest 
to develop of other types of economies. Uh, this is the main idea of the bioeconomy, which is being defended as one of the solutions for the Amazon by the Science Panel for the Amazon. And then uh, in this part, I just want to conclude this first part, and I'm going to share a little bit of the experience of the other project we are doing, indigenous and local knowledge and science. So there is a lot of potential and a lot of experiences already combining and integrating, articulating indigenous knowledge with scientific knowledge for sustainable development, for conservation and development in the Amazon. And there is evidence of this knowledge that this knowledge is very important also as a kind of a shortcut to understand, for example, species, biology, ecology, and conservation priorities, for example, of species. So this knowledge can be used also for what Clinton is doing, for example, this, uh, identifying areas that are prioritized for conservation, maybe for species-based conservation or ecosystem-based conservation. So this knowledge is very important, but not always taking into, con into consideration in policymaking so that's something we would like to strengthen more uh, in our research. Uh, you know, it also using different types of knowledge for decision making uh, has like reduces risks and uncertainties because you have a more complete, you have a more uh, a fuller, you know, uh, knowledge to draw from and to make your decisions. Um, and that this knowledge, of course, is, is experiential. So this idea of experiential learning, learning by doing, is long term and can inform management decisions, but unfortunately hasn't too much. And then finally, uh, lately, but always also indigenous uh, peoples have played an important role in fire management in the Amazon and now are playing a very important role also in fire control and prevention. Uh, Recently, on September 22nd, uh, the President Bolsonaro, President from uh, Brazilian President, gave a speech at the United Nations, uh, and he mentioned that indigenous peoples and the Brazilian Amazon peasants, uh, local communities were uh, the ones that were mainly responsible for the Amazonian fires that we have right now, and that we want to clarify that 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 is a misinformation because actually indigenous uh, people's lands form a very important buffer against deforestation and against fire. Uh, and more than any other type, all indigenous uh, lands and conservation areas form this import important buffer. Also lately, we have a lot of programs and a lot of indigenous people that have been working as firefighters locally and helping, you know, to control these fires around their lands, inside their lands. So they have been also connected to uh, IBAMA and other agencies uh, in this uh, Previ Fogo, it's just called, or Brigadistas, indigenous uh, firefighters. So that's very important to clarify that these fires are not because indigenous peoples are putting fire in the, in the forest. And actually, uh, some of them report, are reporting that it's happening sometimes by people that are invading uh, indigenous lands. And some, some of these fires maybe are criminal fires. But uh, what's happening also is that the forest is drier because of the continued uh, deforestation processes, the long-term deforestation and the expansion of the agro business frontier of the agricultural frontier in the Amazon have caused these areas to be drier, it to be more prone to fire over time. And of course, with climate change, the weather is much uh, drier and hotter. So, you know, it's more conducive to, to those fires. So just to clarify that, uh, great. And then finally, uh, we, I am collaborating with uh, University of Barcelona Scholars in the Lychee project. It's called uh, Local Indicators of Climate Change. And uh, this is um, research that has been shared across 40, 40 sites all over the world. Uh, and we, are, we recognize that indigenous and local people have this long history of interaction with the environment and develop this complex knowledge that will allow them to detect local impacts of climate, climate, climatic variability and also to recognize uh, impacts of climate change already being uh, felt by these indigenous peoples and then be part of the solutions that are offered for climate change mitigation and adaptation 
considered in, in policy for as well. Uh, one important aspect uh, that the Lychee project has also is the citizen science platform in which people can go and input information on local indicators of climate change or events, climate change events um, that are happening in their communities and they can input in the platform. So it's a collection of these different inputs and I think it's a great tool uh, for us to promote as well that will connect uh, indigenous uh, local and scientific knowledge. Uh, we are working with the, in the Raposa Serra do Sol indigenous land in, in Roraima with uh, five indigenous peoples, Wapishana, Makushi, and Garikos, Taurepang, and Patamonas. Uh, we are working with Sinea Wapishana. She, this is Sinea. She is an uh, indigenous leader and environmental manager and she is responsible for the environmental management uh, sector in the indigenous uh, council of Roraima. And here they also have a lot of coordination with people and they are training indigenous agents uh, to work with climate change and to prevent climate change, to document climate change. They, they also um, published this book on the perceptions, local perceptions of climate change recently, and Sine is our partner in this project. Uh, we have been doing, uh, we had an initial training workshop where I was supposed to be going to the field in July, but then everything was postponed because of COVID-19. So we have this now kind of, we are waiting to see what's going on and probably next year, we're gonna conduct a data collection and data analysis. Uh, and also we are, we'll be working on policy oriented publications. This is an important research for Brazil because there is a lot of like um, conversations around climate change and indigenous lands and climate change, but we don't have very strong data on indigenous indicators of climate change and how also indigenous peoples are adapting to climate change. So this will be important to fill out this gap of knowledge that we have, including for policy making. Uh, so we are aiming to, to be uh, with this project uh, to promote inclusion of indigenous perspectives on decision and policy making, providing this grounded evidence of climate changes in impacts and support to scientific research together, as well as development of mitigation and adaptation strategies and strengthening international collaborations across sites, providing training opportunities, also perhaps to FIU students that can join the initiative. And then this is my last slide in conclusion. Um, basically, the future of the Amazon forests are really tied to the future of indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, tied to also Brazil, what's going to happen in Brazil's political and economic processes. Because Brazil detains more than one half of the region's protected lands and forest carbon. Uh, it's important to, to recognize the collective rights of indigenous peoples and local communities to their lands and territories and culture, cultural practices. Uh, it promotes policies that support indigenous and local livelihoods and some examples we, were, we shared here, such as uh, strengthening bi the bioeconomy in the Amazon, the progress of social biodiversity, payments for ecosystem services and carbon trading schemes that are respectful of indigenous peoples' uh, rights. And so what is the role of the nascent uh, FIU Brazilian Studies Initiative in this process? And I, I end with that. Thank you so much. I hope I didn't go over time too much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ataishi. Um, let me pass the, um, the floor then, or the screen rather, to Professor Collado Vides then. Thank you. Thank you, Ligia. Hi, thank you, everybody. And well, Clinton and Simone, this was a fantastic uh, combination of talks. So Simone, maybe you can stop sharing. And uh, so th this is really some of the goals of this seminar series, isn't it? To interchange different perspectives. And I'm going to be short because we have very little amount of time and maybe we want to, to listen to some of the audience. So I will start with some comments to Clinton. And uh, even though I am a marine biologist and working in marine protected areas and uh, also trying to find out the link of what might be a priority areas, isn't it? So we really need to have that integration and we have the science to do that. 
So all everything that is going to be a spatial modeling. And some of the comments, and I think some of the biggest challenges that we are facing, at least in the marine environment, and I think it's going to be also in the terrestrial, is that we are not any longer seeing priority areas or protected areas static, spatially static. We are in a world that climate is changing everything. So there is no such things as intact areas. Everything is moving. So we were just looking that the changes in the Kuroshoa uh, current are bringing corals where we used to have kelps. And that is going to be a big change. And so whatever you design your priority area that is going to have an impact in the policy, as I could read from you in terms of what is going to be the use of land. So just to think about how science is going to be implementing this fluidity that climate change is bringing to us. So, and that is going to have also some impacts, I guess, in the relationship with indigenous people. But let's keep it within the Clinton area. So how policymakers are going to really be at the speed but usually they don't. <laughs> but the, the policymakers and how we scientists can bring that. So some examples is that we are having in Mexico is using GIS, using the concept of niche of a species to move them, to, to, to use them as how they are moving and how we need to move our concept of priority area and as well as a protected area. If we want to have the combination, isn't it, to have some of all of that science behind protected and priority areas. So I think that is going to be something that could be fascinating to talk within FIU and within uh, uh, colleagues that you are bringing in incredible ideas. Also the success of different things. I think that is super important that we realize that there are some success. And I'm really trying to be short because it's the, uh, so I, I have many other notes and um, maybe we can talk a little bit once we bring the audience. So the other part that you were talking, Clinton, is about the um, corruption and enforcement, isn't it? There is no way that we are going to protect nature without enforcement. But there is no way that enforcement is going to work without education or local involvement. So if we do not have the feeling of belonging, and that's where the indigenous people come, isn't it? If you have the feeling of belonging, and that is a absolutely different success of protected areas where you have, for example, in Cancun, that nobody feels that they belong. They go there to extract. But if you have a protected area in the middle of the peninsula where you have the Mayans, that land belongs to them. So the protection is completely different. So enforcement with education and local practices, we scientists need, cannot do it. There is no way that we can do that without the local people and education. So, uh, and then I'm going just to link, I'm going to use this to, to link with Simone. And I'm sorry, I, Clinton, I would love to chat with you in another one with a coffee. Uh, and I think that uh, go, going to, to Simone, I don't think that 500 years is far away. I think it's yesterday and it's still happening. So um, between the, the cross and the stone, the classical uh, Guatemalan book that talks of the constant conquer, isn't it? So the loss of identity of our indigenous people as they lose the land. So that is not in the past, that is happening in the present. And I think that when you're talking about the legacy and the language, I think we need to learn scientists, the language of the different people. When they're talking about sacred, sacred sites, they're talking about priority areas, isn't it? This is sacred because it's protecting, because it's having the ecological function that we call a priority area, because it's having a hot spot of, of uh, species. So I think that if we are able to ourselves get a way of this superiority kind of thing that we know the science, there are some fabulous knowledge of the indigenous people from Colombia showing the interconnectedness of all of the coast. And they did this trip with this little line, isn't it? And showing, and you see that biologists took a long time to realize which were the hot spots. So I think that when you are talking about language and you are talking about conservation, there is a lot of things that we need to learn and that we need to be humble enough to understand that we are talking about the same thing, but with a different language. 
So I, I just love that, Simone, uh, from, from your point of view. And the other thing that scares me, because I don't think it's only, I, I, I don't want to say, so I, I agree completely. There is no going to be recovery. There is no going to be protection without indigenous people. But there is no going to be protection without us. And our Western culture is more than ever alienated from nature. So we, we completely lost that connectivity and respect for Mother Earth, isn't it? Uh, and, and even us that work with, uh, with uh, resources and that we are so connected with that, we still, I don't know, I feel like I need to, to hug my tree to don't forget that we depend on that. And I loved when you were saying about what you are eating comes from nature. And that domestication is old enough beyond of, you know, natural conservation or, or let's say pristine conservation. So um, I just want to, to end up, and it's really short, really short to, well, I, I would love to talk with you. And I think that LAC and FIU uh, is a fantastic place where we can, and, and we are doing that now, isn't it? Interchange ideas in which we can actually see and, and talk a common language or become more global, nature center, if you will, and doesn't matter if you're talking about migration, because migration is here. Climate gentrification is here. Migration related with climate change is, is horrendous, what is expecting to us. So today we have been lucky about the, the hurricane, but look at the fires in California. So I don't want to get into that point. But if we don't learn others' languages, and if we don't involve native indigenous, and I don't know why we look for indigenous still, we should say native or we, uh, that people is indigenous, what does that mean? Is that is still my superior Western way of addressing them, isn't it? They are as human, we are a society. And I think that we need to learn the language and, and through that change our perspective of conservation. And that is not going to be static. That is going to be fluid because climate change is making things moving faster than we think. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Ligia. Uh, thank you uh, to the three presenters for very thoughtful uh, intervention. So we have around 20, 25 minutes for uh, questions and, and comments. And I'd like to open the the, um, the screen uh, to those comments. Uh, I think we have received already some questions in the chat. You can use the chat or you can basically raise your, your hand to ask any any question in the in the meantime let me just pass uh the the mic to clinton for a question uh from hong yu uh, she said clinton can you briefly indicate what factors are going into your decision on priority areas in the atlantic forest sure um so yeah to understand this a little bit um there's an actual i guess it's a a decree in Brazilian federal le legislation about priority areas and how to go about their designation. So there's there's a little bit of predetermined methodology and it has some re restrictions. And <clears throat> coming back to that, um, the idea of like participation and inclusion of indigenous knowledge, there there is a sort of challenge there between what the policy says of how these sorts of priority areas are determined and how best to include information. And I don't think it speaks very well to that sort of knowledge of how to, to go about that. And that was in this process, I remember that was a debate of how to include the, um, the views of indigenous peoples, their lands and potential conflicts and how does it fit into that process? Not to the sense of exclusion, but doubts about how how best to do it and even representation of indigenous uh, peoples because there there's so many different groups and there's so limited capacity for participation in the process in terms of just financial resources and you know who who represents um the indigenous voice for example the entire 
Mata Atlantica. Right? It's a huge extent and you can't invite everybody because nobody's going to pay for all the hotels. And you get in that, that problem of, well, what, what do we do? Um, in terms of the, the methodology and what was included, um, it's all published in, in a report now, but basically it was the presence of, of threatened species, um, tried to include as many as possible. It was very much data limited though. So it tends to be vertebrate species and their distribution, some data on plants, um, and some already identified priority areas for certain groups. For example, caves, there was a huge process that um, had already determined what types of uh, cave systems in, the, in, the, in Brazil were different ranks of priority and why, so we could you know, include that in the process. And then importantly in this round that wasn't done in the last revision of priority areas was inclusion of what is termed cost as a broad term and cost is this, this concept that certain areas are gonna be more favorable or, or difficult for doing conservation of, of biodiversity. So for example, if the area is already completely converted into a pasture or soybean field and there's no forest left, well, that's gonna be really difficult to bring back to an actual state, as opposed to an area that maybe already has a lot of forest and is very far from a road, um, maybe already has programs in place that lend it to be more favorable to conservation activities, even if it's not strictly protected at the moment. And so there's this whole process and workshop of two workshops of how to construct a cost surface that would represent or oops, something fell down outside. Um, what would represent the, the ease or difficulty of different areas being dedicated to, to conservation? Because recognize like, hey, you know, don't beat our head against the wall to protect this one specific place. If protecting another area or three areas will achieve the same goal and be a more, more feasible. And that was a big advance because in the past, people are just kind of designating areas like this is the area. And somebody say, well, that area is impossible for various reasons. Um, it's not a perfect process. Um, we did the best we could um, with the data available. I mean, the data are always getting better, but there are always limitations. Um, one of the things I want to work on in the next few years is, is building up the data sets um, for the next round of revisions so that it's more robust and transparent and been peer reviewed before it goes into that formal process of becoming a legally declared priority area. Um, and there is a process for marine areas. I didn't show it in my map, but there was a whole other group dedicated to looking at marine priority areas. I, I know that they discussed that issue of uh, fluidity and the fact that things move around. I don't know if they were able to include it. I don't think so. I don't think people knew exactly how best to go about it, but, but yeah. Thank you, Clinton. Uh, there is a, a question from Lisol uh, for Simone. Um, let me read the question for, for everybody. Uh, thank you all for great presentation. Simone, a few months ago, I read an article in Israeli daily newspaper, Haaretz, on Sidney Pozuelo, who also researched on Shingu. He stated that after years of engaging with them, he now sees nothing positive about the forging contact with them. And the best thing we can do for them is allowing them to remain to remain isolated. He also claims there has been the same shift in policy. What are your thoughts about that? Thank you so much, Alisa, for this question. Yeah, that's a very controversial topic. Um, I didn't mention uh, in the presentation, uh, but there are around uh, 60, it's estimated around 60 groups uh, in volunteer, completely volunteer isolation um, they say povos isolados, like isolated people, but they are in volunteer isolation. Uh, and it, they were, even the people that I was working with in Xingu, they mentioned and they called that um, the, the wild uh, indigenous, and they are very afraid <laughs> of, of these groups. Uh, so they, you know, children are afraid, they don't, you know, it's not something that they're gonna go and, and try to even connect with them. Um, and so the policy that is being adopted by FUNAI, the National uh, Agency for Indigenous Affairs in Brazil, has been to protect the areas where these groups live 
and the best policy, according to you know many different consultations with anthropologists and even indigenous leaders, is decided that the best policy to manage this is really to lead them uh, the way they want it to be, which is volunteer isolation. If they didn't want to be in isolated, uh, in volunteer isolation, they would already have connected, right? Because a lot of these groups, they, they know what's going on. It's just that they don't want to really to interact. Um, they Sometimes they can even use industrialized tools. They do already, but they just don't want to be part of the contacted groups and, and be part of that um, policy also. Uh, and so in my, so everyone can have an opinion about that, right? And there's no kind of right or wrong. Uh, so my opinion is that they should be, uh, they, they, that those areas should be protected and they should be really, uh, you know, left to do whatever they want to do. So it's, it's also this principle of self-determination, which is like indigenous people should be able to determine what they want for the future, right? So they have the freedom to determine their own future, their own, their own lives. Uh, and I, I believe that this should be applied also applicable to uh, indigenous peoples in volunteer, volunteer in isolation. Uh, but maybe other people have other ideas. That there has been some conflicts and recently an indigenous was killed in one of these conflicts. One of the, the persons just like Sidney Pozuelo uh, Rialto, I, I don't remember his last name, but he was killed in September 9 in, an, in a conflict uh, with indigenous uh, peoples in isolation. There was, they were in conflict also with loggers uh, and he was trying to protect them, but they didn't understand that and, and he was killed with an arrow uh, in his heart. And so I just feel uh, there will be conflicts. There's nothing we can do. I mean, these groups are there living in the forest, there will be conflict. So the, the best we can do is really uh, to put more um, people and more resources to protect these areas. Uh, that, that's how I feel, but maybe people think differently about that. I hope that answered your question, Lisa. So it Thanks. seems, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead, Lee, I'm sorry. Okay. So it seems that we don't have that many uh, questions. We're going to open for comments. I just would like to make a question for, a question for the two of you. So here at FIU, we have several students from different departments. And the topic that you are addressing is really crossing across departments, isn't it? And um, I know that the students like to organize themselves in clubs or the made school, they have their, you know, trips to how to help people around. Could you envision once you come here, how to engage the student community of FIU into your programs or not only one or two undergrads and grads doing a dissertation or a thesis or something like that, but something that could reach a little bit a wider spectrum of students and maybe through lack, I don't know what could be something that lack could do. How do you think it, because Miami is such an incredible place with the diversity, and if the people coming from different places related with Latin American, and I think the, the youth is quite worried about what's going on in the planet, but I don't know if the link of survival and survival of indigenous people and, and nature is really, you know, engraved in them. So maybe the work that you are doing could have a strong impact. Um, question for the two of you, whoever wants to take it first. Huh. It's, it's a good question. And it's something we, we started to discuss within, within lack of how for first understanding the landscape of FIU in, in, in terms of Brazil and what people are already doing um, and how best to go about that, how to engage. Um, having just, well, just officially arrived and not physically arrived yet, it's, it's hard for me to, to gauge the, the best way forward. I mean, I know Miami a little bit from previous work long, long ago in the Everglades, but I, I don't have a good sense of what the best strategy is. Um, I think it is something though that 
I mean, it is fairly um, unusual in the sense of the academic community with you know, in the U.S. that the diversity of FIU and the connections to to Latin America and the Caribbean that we should take advantage of. It's like, hey, you know, these there are lots of people who have direct connections to to other other countries, you know, immediate connections that, you know, certainly I didn't know people when I went through undergraduate or even much graduate school of that level of diversity um, and, and views of the world. So I see it as an opportunity. Um, I don't yet know the best way to go about it with FIU simply because I haven't had a, a chance to really understand what's going on there already. Um, Simone might know better because she was at least in, in, in Florida, she was a bit closer and, and she's been there at FIU for, for a few months now. Well, anyway, whenever you come, knock the door and certainly we'll work together. At least we'll yes, definitely. Yeah. Simone. Yeah. I hope we can get together even with social distancing and mask. Yeah, I'm here at LAC right now. I'm the only one <laughs> today. Uh, yeah, so I think it's a very uh, important question, Ligia, because we are in this process of scoping and developing the Brazilian initiative, and we need to be asking those questions. So thank you for that. I think it's really relevant for us. And I am just trying to kind of recall also what we have done at UF when we had also a program, PCD program that I was connected to, and it was a very vibrant community. And what were the things that they did to create that community, right? To create and strengthen the community. And I think there, there are different things we can do. Uh, one of them is really uh, to promote more synergies with the language program that um, Augusta Vono leads here, the Portuguese language program and some of the outreach events. So, you know, participate more uh, of those events and then try to uh, attract students to um, also we could promote some events at LAC uh, to, to attract that, those students and attract their community, but sometimes maybe more informal events that would have something fun, like uh, with cultural events together, um, mm -hmm. have uh, Brazilian um, uh, guests, speakers remotely, but also in person, and then maybe discover who is the group that plays samba in Miami, there should be some, and then have them on campus. And then, because you know, that's how also we get together, is around culture. And you know, it's very vibrant also, uh, Latin American culture, but Brazilian culture. So I think that those were the things that could uh, move people to, to be also more together. Other uh, possibilities, uh, study abroad programs. Both Clinton and I could do very interesting study abroad programs. And also in the courses, we so do something that is more strategic, not just do our, you know, play our role here as professors, but connect and be more strategic in the things that we are doing so we can also attend to that objective. For example, the courses we are teaching that will have content on Brazil and promote them as having content on Brazil and connected to LAC. So people know, oh, those courses, you know, start to form some curriculum also with Stella uh, is another example. I didn't know Stella is teaching environmental law and probably she's teaching environmental law in Brazil and I'm very interested. So that's another connection. We have other also Brazilian professors here and, and non-Brazilians working in Brazil. So I think there is a lot that we can do uh, to do that, uh, Ligia, hopefully together and soon. Never forget that COIL. COIL is an amazing tool for connecting people, collaboration online, in, uh, online learning, international learning, collabor collaborative online international learning. I think that, uh, well, Stephanie Dosher has been working with uh, LAC a lot and I work a lot with her as well. We, we did run simultaneous courses with different uh, countries in Latin America about marine protected areas, but, but so FIU has a Whole, um, I will say platform, is that the right language? Maybe Lisa can enrich this uh, to promote collaborations online, alive between students from Brazil and what, and, and, and if I, so, oh, I'm so excited. Welcome. <laughs>
Yeah, and I would, this is Lisa, and I would just add that, um, you know, one of the competitive advantages we have in Miami or South Florida in general, of course, is that is that our community already generally has a foundation of knowledge and awareness on Brazil, about Brazil. Um, the linguistic abilities of our students and faculty also uh, reflects that. And so I think different from some other institutions, um, we are able to expose our students even in, in, in Portuguese, right? In authentic language to these topics. Um, and you know, it's not only a priority for, for LAC and the, and the institution, but also the Portuguese program, right? To continue to show the relevance and importance of Portuguese language um, on all issues related to Brazilian studies. So, um, you know, neither Simone or, or Clinton will, will um, have a hard time finding opportunities to help disseminate their research and training and um, I'm certain that there will be there will be opportunities that also exist at the K through 12 level in our local public schools. Um, we have the largest number of bilingual programs in schools in Portuguese and English. Uh, aside from Utah, believe it or not, Utah has a tremendous uh, public program related to Portuguese immersion that some may argue is tied to the mission work of, of the Church of, of um, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the Mormons. But aside from Utah, um, you know, South Florida, Miami, Dade County is really where it's at at that level as well. So I will respect your time while you're getting settled and know you're busy, but many, many opportunities await and, um, and we look forward to supporting you. Thank you both for excellent presentations today. So glad to have you at LAC, and I can't wait until we can actually work face-to-face -face with, with one another. Yeah, I, I join Lisa in that, uh, with that sentiment. I mean, uh, thank you both for, for great presentations. Thank you, Ligia, for the for thoughtful comments. Um, I don't know if there is any other uh, comment, and I mean, we are, uh, eight now in the in the in the session uh, so if anyone wants to make an, a comment um, if not uh, well it's, uh, I will I'll thank you all for your participation for your attendance uh, thank you for again for these interventions and and might this be the, you know the one of the first steps toward uh, great collaboration across our our departments, our schools, uh, in an interdisciplinary mode. Uh, and please count on us uh, for research, for outreach, uh, everything we can do from LAC. Uh, so uh, without anything else, uh, let me close this session again, uh, thanking you all for, for a great a great session. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day, whatever you are. Bye. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Bye bye.